the Graphic Beret. Get that yeah, photo. That's it's my beautiful. Uh, LinkedIn extension and my GitHub. Uh, as I said before, I'm a data scientist mm -hmm. at So some of you might be wondering, uh, what is, oh, why is that? Oh. what do we have to cover today? Oh, uh, so I'm going to go through an overview of Toastar. Uh, I'm going to give you guys a case study of uh, making sense of text in partners.com. I'm going to give you guys some uh, background of traditional approaches to doing NLP, uh, modern-ish approach, and I'll get to what the ish means in a bit, uh, approach to NLP. Uh, and then I'm going to show you guys a framework that I use kind of every day uh, called Spacey. I'm going to hopefully give you guys uh, a live demo if it goes well, and then I'll leave some time uh, for questions uh, at the end. So you guys might be interested to uh, know what Toastar Group is. So how many of you guys have heard of Toastar? I think we're getting kind of popular now. Okay, so for those of you that don't know what Toastar is, I uh, kind of like this little blurb that we have from our, from our big team. Uh, but it's, uh, Toastar exists so that commercial real estate professionals have a clearinghouse of commercial real estate and multiple information that helps them make better, faster decisions, connect with the right people, and get more deals done. Uh, it's kind of a mouthful. Uh, but the whole idea behind CoStar is we're a commercial real estate data company. So we're not about uh, buying and selling uh, real estate. We're about collecting information about real estate and then putting that in products. Uh, and because we have so much data, uh, data scientists like me get really, really excited because we've got a lot of cool projects uh, to work on. So some stats, uh, so 20 or 200,000 professionals uh, use CoStar for information. Uh, and they spend about 40% of their time uh, collecting and managing all of this data uh, from a study from Ernst and Young. So that's kind of why we exist, is to automate that 40% uh, of the time. And so to assist in all this, we have uh, 3,600 employees. Uh, this figure is old, but like 80 offices in seven countries, I think we're even more than that now. Uh, and we're worth about 17 billion, so it's not a, not a super small company by any means. All right, so what I'm gonna talk with you guys about today uh, so one of our products is Apartments.com. Uh, some of you may have visited it. And one of the things that you can do on Apartments.com is you can leave reviews uh, for apartments. So this is an example of uh, two different reviews. We have an example of a fairly positive four-star review saying, you know, this is a great first apartment, uh, the amenities are great, great gym and pool. Um, and then we have an example of a one-star apartment. Uh, so when I moved in, things were clean, but when I moved out, you know, there was a scratch or whatever, and they charged me $35. And so the question that we kind of want to answer is, can we infer uh, the positivity or negativity uh, of a review? And, and you can see there, there's a hint there, so the answer is yes. So there is a way that we can feed in uh, this text, uh, this uh, text of the review, and we can have the machine spit out whether that review is a more positive review or a more negative review. And that's kind of uh, the use case that I'm going to be going, with, uh, going through with you all today. All right, so the first part is we have to get computers to understand text. And the sort of subtitle to this is computers can't understand text. So this whole thing is a lie, right? Um, but computers can understand numbers. So we have to somehow convert uh, the text within the review uh, into numbers that a computer can understand. Uh, and so the traditional way that we do this is called this one-hot uh, included representation. And the idea is that we want to have a really big body of work, uh, body of words, uh, that we typically call a corpus. And so this could be a collection of news articles, um, all of Wikipedia is a really common corpus. Uh, there's several of them out there. And the idea is that we're gonna scan through this corpus of words and we're gonna order every single word in that corpus. So we're gonna go in a dictionary. And so you can think of, it doesn't have to be necessarily an alphabetical list, uh, but it's a list of every single possible word in that body of text. And we're gonna string those along in some order. So this is kind of an example. So we have this sentence, uh, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. If any of you ever took keyboarding, you'd be very familiar. Uh, so we first get the token, so the individual unique words out of that uh, sentence. So we have brown, dog, fox, dog, and so forth. And we want to convert those into a vector. So the idea behind this vector is up at the top, we have our entire really, really, really long dictionary, right? So in this case, our dictionary starts with the word ant, and it ends with the word uh, zebra. And we want to convert this into a vector. So the idea is we have this really long uh, dictionary, 
And by default, everything is set to a zero. So every single word in that dictionary is a zero. But if that word is present in uh, the sentence, then we change it from a zero to a one. So if you can kind of imagine, we have this really, really, really long vector, and then somewhere in that vector, there's the word brown, and it's set to a one. And then somewhere farther in that vector, there's the word fox, it's set to one. Giraffe is not in our sentence, so that's set to zero, and, and so on. So we have this really, really, really long vector. And this is traditionally what we would feed into our you know, fancy machine learning algorithms uh, to produce some kind of response. Uh, but there's some challenges uh, with this particular approach. So first thing I kind of alluded to, these vectors are really, really long, right? So think of all the unique words in Wikipedia, how long that list is, right? It's, it's massive. And so computers can kind of have a hard time when you're trying to process uh, vectors that are quite that long. The other thing is they're very, very sparse, right? So if you're gonna have like one or two sentence phrases, the majority of the words in that dictionary are not gonna be in that sentence unless that sentence has like very, very extensive vocabulary. Uh, it's highly unlikely. So as a result, most of the uh, uh, positions in that vector are gonna be zero, right? Those, those words aren't present. So again, that's kind of hard for the computer to deal with. Uh, and then finally, these vectors can be very noisy, right? So you can have a lot of words that don't really necessarily provide any meaningful information. So like think of, in our case, like the word the, right? The, the, the doesn't really provide any meaningful information in terms of is this a positive or, or a negative sentence, right? Uh, so we have all these other sort of you know, noise that we have to sift through in order to more effectively uh, solve this test. So how can we uh, address this problem? So this is the, the more modern approach. Uh, and I say more modern because if any of you guys are in the, the NLP space, it's uh, natural language processing space. Uh, it's exploded over the past year and all this other crazy stuff is going on. Uh, if you're curious, look up something called BERT or Bernie, it's like Sesame Street right now. Um, but uh, the more sort of modern approach is something called uh, word for that. So the idea is that we want to have vectors that have a fixed length, so say like maybe 100 uh, digits or 300 digits are common, uh, and that are dense, right? So that most of the positions in that vector contain some kind of value other than zero. And so the whole idea behind word for that is we want to understand uh, the context of the word. So what are the words that are around other words in our corpus? So again, if we have this sentence, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog, we can select a focus word, so in this case jumps, and we look at the context words around it. And the question that word to that tries to answer is given this focus word, can we predict the presence of a context word or how likely that word is to appear. So we can have kind of a, an example of this. So my focus word is the, we then have these pairs, the and quick and the and brown. These are the two focus words that appear um, when we see, or sorry, the two context words that appear when our focus word is the. And we move forward, right? So now our focus word is quick and now our context words are quick, the, quick, brown, quick, fox, right? And this can go on and on and on uh, throughout the entire sentence. What's really nice about this approach is typically when you're talking about you know, machine learning, you might hear around like we need training data, right? We need to annotate a whole bunch of training data. In this case, assuming that our corpus is using proper grammar, um, we basically get our training data for free, right? So as long as we can take this really, really big corpus and all the sentences are more or less grammatically correct, we can identify all these different pairs. And then what we do is we take these pairs, and we feed them into a fancy neural network. Now, I'm not gonna go through all the math, I'm just gonna do kind of a bit of hand waving here. Uh, but the idea is that in our neural network, we feed in this sort of one hot vector representing a single word. So we have a really long dictionary, and one word uh, set to one, and that's the, the current focus word. And the idea is that we feed this through our, our neural network, and then on the other end, it's gonna spit out, these are the context words um, that are most likely to appear uh, given that focus word. Now, in this particular case, we actually don't care what the context words are. That's not relevant to our problem. What we care about is actually this, this what's noted as this hidden layer. So the idea kind of behind neural networks without getting into too much nitty gritty is you have these different layers, right? And each layer is gonna take in a series of numbers and, and then it's gonna apply a set of weights to those numbers and then 
produce another series of numbers. And so what we're actually interested in is not the actual output layer of what are the words that are most likely. We're interested in this, the output of this middle hidden layer. Because if you notice, this hidden layer is fixed to a certain size, say like 300 neurons. And the idea behind this is that we can feed in one of our words, and this hidden layer will output a dense representation, which, uh, or a dense word embedding is what we typically call it. So this is the same sort of words that we had in our sentence before, but now instead of representing them as like a really, really, really long sequence of zeros and then like one, one, now we have this more dense uh, representation where every single position uh, has some real value. Um, now what's kind of interesting about these word embeddings, and we'll get to this a bit in the, in the demo, is they kind of exhibit this sort of uh, positional aspect in the sense that words that are similar, if you were trying to, you obviously can't visualize it, right, because it's like n-dimensional space, right? Uh, but if you tried to compress this down into like 2D space, the idea is that words that are similar to each other uh, will end up landing uh, in a similar region of that really large multi-dimensional multi -dimensional space. It's, it's hard to visualize, right? Uh, and this provides us some really kind of interesting um, capabilities. All right, so then how do we do fancy deep learning with text? So um, the framework that I like to use is called uh, Spacey. Uh, the guy that created uh, Spacey has this really nice blog post where he outlines sort of the four steps to doing uh, deep learning uh, with text, and that's uh, these steps right here. So the first step uh, he likes to call embed, and that's where we take a really long one hot encoded vector representations of words, and then we convert those into sort of these more dense uh, continuous uh, vectors, which is what we saw with uh, word embed. The next step is we want to encode. So we want to take those word representations of individual words, and given a sentence, we want to produce some kind of representation of that entire sentence. Uh, then we attend, so the idea is we want to reduce that really large sentence representation into a single, easier to digest uh, representation. And then finally at the end, we do our predictions. So kind of what this looks like uh, graphically is we have our word, right? We put it through our you know, fancy like word embed, whatever algorithm we want, and we produce some embedding vector. Right, which is what we just saw. What Spacey does uh, for its encoding uh, representation is actually kind of a bit unique, uh, but the idea is that you have all these 1D vectors, right? So for an entire sentence, we have this series of 1D vectors. What Spacey does is it takes each of those vectors and it stacks them on top of each other, and then we have a grid. So each row of that grid corresponds to one word in the sentence, and that's how it represents uh, its, that's its sentence representation. Okay. Then we have to attend, so then we have to convert this into a single vector representation. Uh, Spacey uses something called an attention mechanism uh, to do this. Again, I'm going to do some hand waving and not get really into the details, uh, but the idea is you take this large sort of 2D uh, representation of the sentence, you have this other vector called uh, a context vector, and it basically uses this to then compress <coughs> it down into a single 1D array. Because at the end of the day, the way that most uh, machine learning algorithms work is they need to have a single 1D representation of the information that you're trying to perform predictions on. So then finally, uh, the fun part, once we have this 1D representation, we want to do a prediction. So in our case, we're going to take this 1D prediction of the uh, review, and we're going to output a value that is either positive or negative based on the sentiment of the sentence. Is that kind of Makes sense. Questions here so far? Yes. What you're saying 1D, it's not 2D? It's a one dimensional or two dimensional? It's a, yeah, one dimensional array. It's just a list. Okay. Yep. So it's not it's not a, it's not a grid. It's just at the end of the day, it's just a list. Oh, okay. So they're all the yeah. Okay. Any, any other questions before we keep going? You all you all are totally lost now, right? You're either just glazing over or <laughs> you want to digest all the pizza and just leave, right? <laughs> Any, any, so any, any is, is this the, the one dimensional array, the predict part that gets fed to the, the neural network? Yeah, so you can think of this as, you know, once you get this 1D array, then this is what you're feeding. The neural network is actually doing this, like as you're oh. feeding stuff in, but the final product is you get a 1D array, and then you can actually take this 1D array and put it through whatever algorithm you want. Um, 
in this case, it'll be the, the alpha mm -hmm. layer of spacey um, to get your final uh, sentence. But the whole idea is eventually you have to get down to some 1D representation so that you can then compute your final uh, All right, so that brings me to what is Spacey? So Spacey, their kind of full tagline is industrial strength <coughs> net language processing. So it's a Python framework for performing a variety of different NLP tasks. Uh, one of them is text classification, which is what we're doing today. We're trying to classify text as either positive or negative. There's a bunch of other cool stuff too, like uh, named entity recognition, so pulling out certain like people, places, things, and sentences, uh, parse speech tagging. Uh, importantly, it, can, it comes with some pre-trained models uh, so you can quickly uh, get started. All right, so demo, right? So that's it, that's it for the theory. No, no more slides, no more death by PowerPoint. Um, so now hopefully, if everything goes well, we can go through a demo uh, of this. And I always have to put some ex-Stacy in any of one of my presentations. And I find this one quite applicable. Uh, to how this stuff tends to work. So, all right. So hopefully it works. All right, so I have to boot into Linux real quick because I don't do any dev work in Windows. <laughs> I can't use it anymore. All right, so, um, if any of you guys have, uh, or some of you guys might not be familiar with this, this is called a Jupyter Notebook. Uh, and what this is, is this is kind of like a web-based um, it's, it's a notebook, right? So it, it's not really a, like IDE in the sense where you have like text files and you have like a debugger and stuff. It's more like I have some document uh, and I can run little blocks of code in that document and then see the output. And so this is really useful when you're kind of playing around with data and quickly trying to do things. Um, also very useful for when you're giving presentations because then we can kind of follow along uh, to all the different parts of the code um, and see what they do. All right, so to begin, uh, I already ran this slot, but you want to import Spacey. So if any of you guys haven't done Python before, uh, Python is a very sort of forgiving uh, language. You can kind of just import stuff and then use it. There's this other Python comment or comic uh, where you can like import anti-gravity and then fly. You should actually try doing that in Python. If you've never done it before, you'll get some interesting results. Um, but you just import the library. Uh, and then you're off to the races. I'm also gonna set a flag here because I don't actually want to try to train my model uh, right now because it takes about an hour, so I have a pre-trained one that we can kind of play with. Mm -hmm. um, next line of code is for downloading one of the pre-trained uh, spacey models. So in this case, I'm gonna download the medium English one. Uh, again, I've already done this, so I'm not going to run it, but I am gonna load, hopefully, uh, the pre-trained uh, spacey English model. Is uh, .md just a normal like extension for models? Uh, for spacey it is, yeah. Oh no, no, md stands for medium. There's also an lg oh, for large an and an sm for small. Uh, what's important about the medium model and the large model is it comes with the word embeddings, which is what I want. Okay, so now we're gonna do some fun stuff with uh, word vectors or word embeddings. So if we have this uh, very simple sentence uh, called clean man, woman, uh, we can ask Spacey to process uh, this sentence. So you can see here I assigned the model to something called NLP3 for pre-train. Uh, and now I'm gonna call that model on this particular sentence and I'll get something called a document, okay? So for each token, um, we can basically just access this like an array. So we have this array of, uh, at index zero, we have queen, at index one, we have man, and at index two, we have uh, woman. So I'm gonna split all those out. And, uh, as I said before, each token has a unique vector representation. So you can see they're kind of long. Uh, I think by default, Spacey uses oh, 300 dimensional vectors, but this would be uh, the vector for uh, the token queen. So as I said, vectors exhibit this kind of like spatial uh, qualities to them that we can play around with. So we can actually do math with them, which is kind of kind of cool. Uh, so what happens if we take uh, the vector representation of man, uh, subtract the vector representation of woman, and add the vector representation of queen to this? If any of you guys have seen this before, uh, don't answer. <laughs> but we'll get this uh, mystery token, right? 
So we'll get a uh, mystery vector, right? So the idea is uh, what token in our corpus is most similar to this mystery vector? So we can do that. Um, so what I'm doing here is I'm using something called uh, cosine uh, simul similarity. And the idea behind this, I don't know if there's, is there like a whiteboard or something on this at all? Yeah. Uh, no, no markers. Oh, yeah, one over here. Okay, cool. All right. So the idea behind this, yeah, I'm going to dig up some trigonometry on you guys. Um, so, all right. Yeah, there. So we have uh, two vectors, right, in this space. Okay. Or three. All right. So what cosine similarity does. So when you guys were in, you know, like geometry class or whatever, you probably learned something called Euclidean distance, right? So you're taking uh, the distance in Euclidean space between two points. Um, the problem with this is that we could have uh, vectors that are very similar. Let's say like, uh, I don't know, like man and woman, right? But they could be very far apart in Euclidean space, just for whatever reason, how, how the vectors lay out. But they follow kind of the same direction. So if you had some other, I don't know, dog, whatever, right? So if you were trying to figure out which one of these vectors was the most similar to man in this space, uh, and we were using Euclidean distance, we would probably say dog, right? Because the distance between here and here is smaller than the distance between here and here, right? Uh, but what we're actually interested in is vectors that are going more or less in the same direction. So we're not really worried about magnitude. We're more interested in um, the, the direction of the vectors. And the way that we can do that is we can measure uh, the cosine of the angle here. And we can see, well, the cosine of this angle is smaller than the cosine of that angle. And so we're going to say that these two are more similar than those two. And that's essentially what cosine similarity does. So. Not, not, not too bad, not too bad trigonometry. Yeah. Okay, so that's basically what I'm doing here. I'm looping through um, every single uh, word in our corpus, which is uh, this, this vocabulary here. Uh, and then I'm going to compute the cosine similarity, and then I'm going to append that to, to a list, right? It actually doesn't take that long. Uh, I'm also using this really cool library here called TQDM, and what that does is that gives you a really nice like loading bar um, of the process. Probably should have started that before I went through that demo, but uh, anyway, it doesn't take too long. You can see there's quite a few number of words uh, in this corpus, uh, and it's uh, computing the similarity of uh, our mystery vector to all of them. And again, it's doing this in like 300 dimensional space, right? So you can't really Visualize it on a whiteboard, but the same kind of principles um, apply. Okay. Almost there. What's the corpus for this Wikipedia, like you said? No, so this is on the web core corpus. It's actually a proprietary corpus that you have to pay for. Um, that Spacey already paid the money to acquire, uh, and they're able to release models trained on it, they just can't release the corpus itself. Um, I think it's a combination of like news articles and web articles, but a whole bunch of stuff. Um, okay, so now what I'm doing is I'm just doing some fancy Python to reverse the order of this list and uh, have it sorted in terms of the most similar word uh, will be at the head of the list and the least similar will be at the tail. Um, so just some Python magic here. Okay, so now we're going to print uh, the 10 most similar words uh, mystery. Any, any guesses before I, before I do it? Any, any ideas? Uh, all right, so uh, unsurprisingly, queen shows up, right, because that was one of our inputs, uh, but we also get king. So the idea is that, if we go back to our original, Thing. So man minus woman plus queen equals king. It's kind of uh, the gist of it. So kind of get all these interesting uh, relations. Now you can see we also get some other similar words, right? 
we get prince, commoner, and highness. So those are all things that are also kind of related to that sort of royalty um, space. So you can do all sorts of really cool, interesting things uh, with this. Basically, you can do other fun things. So I have this other um, piece of text. This is actually from our CoStar News. Uh, it says, only months following AT AT&T's Whopper 2.2 billion sale leaseback lease back deal involving property in Manhattan's Hudson Yards, the telecommunic, so it's, 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 a, it's a finance story, right? <laughs> so we can actually extract certain, so Spacey by default will recognize certain entities uh, on its own, and we can have it render that for us. So we can see here that we can say, okay, this is a date, this is an org or, or a company, uh, this is some money value, that's a geopolitical entity, uh, and that's a location. So you can already kind of see where this can be really useful, right? You have a lot of, of articles, and you're interested in you know, extracting these sort of pre-trained entities, uh, you can do this. Basically, it also allows you to train your own models uh, if you have your own custom entities uh, that you're interested in. All right, so getting back to a bit more of what I was talking about initially, which is doing sentiment analysis, so positivity and negativity uh, with apartments. So we have this sentence, uh, this is a great first apartment. Spacey will also render out the full um, sort of dependency tree. So this can be really useful when you're trying to understand sentences that say, okay, they're saying, they're talking about an apartment, right? That's a noun. What are they saying about it? Well, they're saying it's great and it's first. Those are the adjectives. Uh, and what is the, the subject of the sentence? The subject is this. So this can be really, really useful if you're trying to you know, build like a chat bot or something like that. Uh, when you're actually trying to parse the structure of the sentences, um, Spacey kind of gives you all of that um, out of the box. All right, so now we're actually gonna do some sentiment analysis. Oh, I already did this. So I'm actually gonna use a slightly different data set because I wanted to use one that you guys would all have access to. So this is the um, IMDb movie data set. So it's the same idea. Uh, we have a bunch of movie reviews. So this is an example of a movie review. So in this case, this one's probably negative because it says this is one of the worst films I've ever seen. Um, and then at the end of the sentence, we have a label. So it would be either zero for negative or one for positive. And they have like 50,000 of these things labeled and it's split 50-50, uh, 25,000 positive, 25,000 uh, negative. But this data set is actually freely available with uh, Spacey. You can just import it like so, and then load it, uh, and you instantly have access to this data set. All right, so Spacey kind of requires a specific format when you're loading the data, and this is kind of what this um, little snippet of code is responsible for. It's just sort of transforming this into a JSON representation uh, for Spacey to do a lot, and I'll kind of show you guys what that looks like. So here it's uh, 50,000 examples, 25,000 training, 25,000 tests, and then each one of those are split 50-50 balance between positive and negative. So if we look at any one of these examples, all I've done is I've taken that sentence, uh, and now I've appended this little like JSON dictionary on the back, so it has cats for categories. Uh, in this case, we only have one category, which is sentiment. Spacey can also do multi-category uh, type classifications, you can assign multiple labels. Uh, and in this case, it's a negative sentence, so it's positive. So this is kind of the, the format that Spacey is expecting to be provided when you're doing it training down. Any questions so far? Good? Yeah. All right, so now this is where all the magic happens. So we're gonna create a pipeline. Which is what this, oh, oh okay. which is what this little bit of code does here. So what I'm doing is I'm telling Spacey, I want to create a new Planck model, so it's not pre-trained, and it's going to be designed to parse English. So Spacey supports other languages, uh, they keep adding them to the list. The classical European languages, like you know, French, uh, German, uh, Italian, and Spanish. We also have some Asian languages as well, uh, but we're going to be working English here. Uh, and I'm going to add a component to this pipeline for text classification or text cap categorization classification. Uh, and then finally, I'm going to tell it that the label that you're going to be responsible for is this label called uh, sentiment, and then I'm going to add that to the pipe. 
So the idea behind Spacey is you can kind of build these pipelines. You can add multiple different components at each stage. So let's say first you wanted to classify, you know, um, reviews in the being positive or negative, and then you wanted to take the positive reviews, and then you wanted to pull out like the or take the negative reviews and pull out the person that they were talking about, or something like that. You can add all of those sort of components onto this pipeline. Um, like so. All right. So finally. Uh, I'm going to show you what training the model would look like, but I'm not actually going to train it. So this, this is it. This is all the magic, right? This is where we train our fancy deep neural network uh, and get our, our model that can classify sen uh, sentences to be positive or, or negative. So not that much code, right? You guys maybe were expecting uh, a bit more. Uh, but the idea is that we start off uh, and we're going to say we're only going to train um, text classification. Because like I said, Spacey had offers a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, we're not really interested in that. Uh, and we're going to get uh, an optimizer. So the whole kind of idea, again, without getting too much into the nitty gritty, is we're trying to minimize um, loss or kind of minimize the error of uh, the network. So as we you know, classify things and then we check to see, you know, did we get it right? We're trying to reduce the number of examples that we get wrong. Uh, and we use a, an optimizer uh, to do that, and Spacey provides us one, like you say, begin training. The next thing that we do is we typically, uh, we don't want to uh, necessarily present the entire data set all at once, right? Because that might kind of overwhelm our network. So we can split it up into little chunks and say, you know, learn on this chunk first, and then learn on this chunk, and then learn on this chunk, so on and so forth. Um, and Spacey provides uh, utility for that uh, for creating uh, batch sizes. Now what I'm doing here is I'm doing kind of a trick. So the idea is that at the beginning when the network is really dumb, um, it can have a hard time learning from things. So we're gonna give it very, very small chunks to learn from. Uh, but as it gets better, the idea is that we can start giving it more larger and larger batches uh, to learn from and we can kind of get to our, uh, our final solution faster. And so that's what uh, this does. So I'm gonna start with a, a chunk size of just four and eventually I'm gonna scale it all the way up to 32, and the way I'm gonna scale it is by, by this factor. So it'll start with four, then it'll multiply it by 1.001, and then you'll be to figure out the next size, and it rounds to, to an integer, of course. Um, so that's kind of how, it, how it's scaling up. Again, I have my uh, TQDM for just doing the range, and the idea is that we do this for a number of iterations. So we have our whole data set, we break it into chunks, we train, and then we repeat the process for a number of iterations. Uh, in this case, I'm using and the idea is that for each iteration, we want to scramble the data, right? Because, for example, let's say for whatever reason, um, all the positive examples came first, and then all the negative examples came after that. Instead of our network learning that, uh, actually learning this is a positive example and this is a negative example, it might just learn, well, first you're going to show me all the positive examples, and then you're going to show me all the negative examples. Right? So we don't want it to learn that. We don't want it to learn something from the ordering of our data. And so what we can do is just every iteration, we'll just randomly scramble it into a different order. And then we break it up into our little chunks. And then from each chunk, we're going to get uh, the text and then the annotation, so if it's positive or negative. And then we're going to tell Spacey, please learn from this. Right? So we say, NLP update. Here's your text. Here's your labels. This is the optimizer you're going to use. Um, you're going to store your loss, so your error here, and uh, dropout rate is, is again something specific for, for neural networks. You're basically going to be um, sort of turning off certain neurons in the network uh, by a certain percentage, and it's going to get a bit better, but again, I won't get into the details of that. But that's it, and then we just keep looping and looping and looping and looping, and hopefully our error um, goes down, and we get a nice, nice model. So this is all, all the magic of, of deep learning, the spacey, and like 20 lines of code. Any, any questions there? Yes? So this, uh, this might sound kind of ignorant, but oh. you're talking about it breaking up into chunks yes. and then getting better and better. Mm -hmm. um, how does it relate to, like, just from the two slides I've taken, like Adaboost versus Spacebring? Is that anywhere related to that? Um, not, not necessarily. Uh, that, that's a different, that's not a neural network technique, right, typically. Um, so, yeah, not, not really the, the same. Um, this is more just for the, for the network in order to be able to minimize um, its loss. It's easier for it to kind of digest things in, in smaller bits. Um, so. 
And yeah, and the other thing you could look at that's kind of similar is that maybe for whatever reason you get batches that are like really lucky and really easy, right? And the idea is that with the scrambling, hopefully the batches will kind of, um, so kind of similar, but, but not really exactly the same thing. Um, okay, so again, I said I'm not gonna do this because it takes about an hour, and I, I don't think you guys would want to stay around that long. Um, so I'm just gonna load one that I already trained uh, ahead of time. And I added a flag just in case I accidentally ran this line. Uh, it won't actually start training to over at my home. So good to add this. All right, so uh, the next thing that we have to do is now we have this you know, super amazing model. Uh, we need to evaluate it. And I know Dr. Koshak's in the back and will skin me alive if I don't talk to you guys a bit about uh, how to properly evaluate models. So uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use uh, something called scikit-learn or sklearn. Uh, and I'm going to use that to generate uh, a classification report uh, for uh, my model. So the idea is you saw at the beginning I had this sort of training set and this testing set. So the idea is I split my data, sub, data set into these two halves, right? And I train my model on the training set and I evaluate it on the testing set. Why do we do that? Well, because if we were training our model on, and evaluating our model on data it's already seen, right? That's not really helpful for us because the whole point of these models is we want to deploy them in situations where we don't know uh, the outcome. We don't know the, the true labels. And so to kind of simulate that, we're going to give it data that the model hasn't seen before and then compute our evaluation uh, on that. Um, if you're evaluating your model on the same data that you trained it on, you're kind of lulling yourself into a false sense of security because typically you'll have much higher performance metrics on data that it's already seen and you never want to trust that if you're going to be putting that into production. All right, so let's, now for the sake of speed, again, I'm not, I would not condone doing this, but I'm not going to use the entire test set. I'm only going to use the first 10,000 examples just because it's a bit quicker for me to, uh, to show you guys the numbers. But of course, if you were doing this kind of for real, you would want to evaluate on the entire test set. All right, so it still takes a while even for 10,000. So there's no loading bar this time? No loading bar this time, no. There's no way I can get into like a loop. Just, well, I, eh, not, not really. It was just calling the classification report on SKLearn, so we just kind of have to wait. Uh, but it, does, it doesn't take too long. Uh, while we're waiting, I can talk about a couple different uh, performance metrics. So the one that you guys have probably heard of is like accuracy, right? That's the easiest <coughs> one to understand, right? So it's just the percentage of, uh, so the percentage of samples that I get right. So if I have you know, 100 samples and I correctly assign the label to uh, 90 of them, then I would have like 90% you know, accuracy, right? Um, but that can actually be kind of misleading, right? So the idea is like, well, what if your data set is highly imbalanced, right? What if you don't have equal numbers of both the positive and the negative? So the example I like to give is, let's say you're working for a hospital, right? and you're evaluating patients to see if they're sick or healthy, right? So most people that go to a hospital are probably sick, right? You're not gonna have super healthy people going to a hospital and like getting checkups. Um, and so the majority of your data set will probably be sick people. Let's say that like 90% of your data set is sick people, right? But you want to develop a model that says, okay, well this person, uh, you know, is healthy, we can, we can send that data set into your, your fancy model, right? And the only thing that you're using for evaluation is accuracy. You can get 90% accuracy just saying everybody is sick, right? Because 90% of the data is sick people, right? So it's not really that useful of a metric. And that's where some of these other metrics um, come in. So the ones that I tend to like to use that are too difficult to understand are uh, precision and uh, recall. So the idea behind uh, precision and recall is they're kind of like, like trade-offs. So what precision measures is it's the percentage of, uh, so let's say I have another data set, right? It's um, apples and oranges. And let's say there's 20 apples in the data set and there's 10 oranges. And I train my model to you know, say this is a picture of an apple and this is a picture of an orange. So then I get the outcomes. And let's say that my um, model predicted that there were uh, uh, 10 apples uh, in the, the data set, 
And then when I look at the, the true labels, only eight of those 10 were actually apples. So what precision measures is it measures the percentage of that set that I got kind of correct. So in that case, my precision would be um, eight out of 10, or eight percent. What recall measures is what is the percentage of the label that I was able to correctly sort of recall from the total set. So again, the idea is if I have 20 apples in my data set, I was able to correctly identify eight of them, then my recall would be eight out of 20, right, or 40%. Um, and so again, these are kind of trade-offs. So you can typically sort of fine tune things to say, you know, I want to be more precise uh, at the expense of having lower recall or, or vice versa. Now in this particular case, because this data set is more, is actually perfectly balanced, but in this case it wasn't perfectly balanced, it was like 10,000, accuracy can actually be a somewhat okay uh, metric to use here. And we can see that we got 88% uh, uh, or, yeah, 88% accuracy. Uh, the other score here, F1 score, is you can think of it as kind of like an average of precision and recall. So if you wanted to only have one number, instead of looking at two, uh, you can use the F1 score. I tend to like to have um, two because I think it gives a more complete picture. You know, some people are like, well, I only want to have one metric to concern myself with, and that's where F1 tends to be a bit of a better um, uh, metric, in my opinion, than just straight accuracy. And you should always say F1 score. Don't just say F score, because there's other types of F scores besides F1, and people like to just say F score and assume that it's F1, but don't do that. Uh, actually say that it's F1, because that'll avoid that. All right, so let's, uh, let's try it out. Okay, so, uh, I don't know, this was a great movie. And we can see we get a sentiment score of 99 point, you know, 0.999 whatever percent. So, fairly positive, right? Uh, let's see, this movie sucks, right? And 0.01, so really, really negative, right? Any, anybody have some examples they want to want to try? Or mediocre. Me, me, mediocre. Mediocre. Uh, this movie was Arty. 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 Yeah, these there you go. There you go. Uh, really negative. So four to ten to the minus five. This <laughs> man. This, this movie's not very bad. Okay. So that's that's where it's gonna get tricky, right? So this movie was not very bad. Does that mean there's only a little? It's donated. So that's where um, negations are kind of the bane of this existence, right? Um, it's very difficult to understand negations. And if you are, you have to do some more sort of fancy techniques uh, to get around it. Yes? What about like an example that you had up above where it said, like, I don't like this film, the only positive thing I can say about it. How would it, how would it weight that positive word? I don't know, we can try it. So the other thing, if you recall, this is actually trained on like much larger blocks of text, right? We're just giving it little tiny sentences, um, but it was really trained to handle like larger, larger blocks. So let's do it now. Saying that's negative. negative. So the, the only kind of thing with these particular types of approaches is they're kind of black boxes, right? It's kind of hard to say why the model did what it did. All we get is this is the output. Um, and so there's a lot of work that's been done to try to do, you know, explain why a deep neural network does what it does, but that's still kind of a, an open research um, area. Uh, it's, it's very difficult. So if you want something that's more explainable than this, then this might not be uh, the approach for you. Yeah, in the back. Yeah, so it's, it's a common indicator in a way the model shows for all of this. If you look at the support of the sentiment, it's identical for all three remaining sentences. The size of the parts that they are completely different. Ah, yeah, yeah, you're right. So basically, what you say from your network 
is that you get the negative output right. every single time. Every single time. Basically the maximum of negative output. So yes. there's the lowest possible scores and your notebook doesn't know what to do with this. Right, kind of right. Thing. Yes, okay. you're right. Yep. Since you can't have a zero, I guess. It's so the other thing is that if in our initial corpus, like the word mediocre didn't appear, right? So we don't have a word embedding for it. And so that can cause um, issues as well. And there's different ways to handle that. Um, the simplest way to handle it is you just have this sort of like out of vocabulary vector that's just kind of like a catch all for anything that it hasn't learned, seen, or seen before. But again, then you can get weird results like this where it's like, oh, I haven't seen that word before. I don't know what to do with it. It's negative or whatever, right? Um, so it really depends kind of on the, the data that you train it on and the embeddings that it has. Um, whether or not it's able to recognize uh, those words. So like slang, for example, yeah. it would identify like slang based off like the data set. So it's kind of interesting. So Spacey ships with the pre-trained uh, vectors, right? So when you're training this model, it's not going through work to that and doing all of that for you. There's ways that you can provide your own word embeddings if you want. Uh, but even if like the word mediocre was in this particular corpus, right, in this collection of database, um, IMDB reviews, if it wasn't in the, um, the embeddings that Spacey shipped with, it still won't recognize it. And so Spacey embeddings are kind of trained on you know general English, um, but if, if you have a more specialized corpus, you might have to look into training your own embedding model and then loading that into Spacey to get better results. So um, what if you made your whole sentence like an all caps? How would that essentially pronounce it? Yeah, so I think Spacey does um, some pre-processing under the hood to like lowercase stuff automatically for you mm -hmm. uh, before it feeds it in to kind of get around um, that problem. But in conventional, traditional NLP, so again, Spacey tries to kind of make things easy. You would typically do all of that stuff ahead of time, right? So you want to lowercase all your words. Um, you typically have like a list of what's known as stop words, so words that don't provide any meaningful information, like the word the, you would automatically remove them. Um, you can also do what's called lemmatization, so the idea is that like running and run are really kind of like the same word, and so there's ways that you can kind of compress all that down into a single representation called a lemma. Spacey does all of that for you behind the scenes. Um, so there's a lot going on behind the scenes to kind of uh, make this work. But the nice thing about it is it does actually expose all those internals to you want, uh, so if you do need to do something a bit more hands-on, um, you, you have the ability to do that in this framework as well. Is it, <clears throat> what if you like wanted it to tell the difference between if somebody was writing in all caps versus if they were just typing a sentence normally? Right, so there's ways that you can disable certain components of the spacey pre-processing, like if you want it to understand that like capitalization is significant, uh, there's certain settings that you can adjust depending on what you're trying to do. Because uh, sometimes capitalization is important uh, in, in the sense that right, if somebody's writing in all caps and they have lots of exclamation points, probably pretty angry. Um, or they're super, super excited, maybe, one of the two. Um, and so if you want things to be you know, incorporated into the model, there's ways that you can adjust the space to allow that. Any other questions? What about this movie was OK at best? <laughs> so again, you know, it's our, uh, or actually, no, this is the most positive. So this is, again, uh, the model going completely the opposite direction. So I think this, again, is part of, because this was trained on much longer sentences, it's having a hard time um, working with really small phrases, because it doesn't have a lot to go on. Let me see. Okay, then. So this is, this is the opposite example, right? It's going to the really at high end of the spectrum. Any other questions? Um, other than Scikit-Learn and Spacey, what other um, NLP libraries do you generally use? Um, so Spacey is the one that I typically use a lot. Um, there's also uh, like NLTK was the one that was around for a long time. Uh, that still has some capabilities that I like to use, but I've, I've kind of replaced that with Spacey. 
Um, if you're trying to train your own embeddings, uh, there's this library called GenSim, uh, which is designed to allow you to um, you know, train your own word embeddings. And Spacey actually uses GenSim under the hood when it trains its word embedding. Um, so those are the kind of the main ones that I plan to, to utilize. So. Yeah. You guys have any questions about like CoStar or, or anything like that in terms of just this stuff? No, no more questions. <laughs> well, I, I mean, at CoStar, how, how much data do you guys usually deal with? How much data do we deal with? Um, a lot. <laughs> uh, I don't remember how many reviews we have at apartments.com, but it's it's quite substantial. Uh, we're doing a senior design project here with ECU, which is an image-based project, and we have about 250,000 images that we're dealing with, so it's not a small amount of data. Um, it's, it's a decent, decent amount of data to, to play around with. Big data. So. Yes? Uh, how important was learning Linux? How important was learning Linux? <laughs> um, extremely, because if any of you have ever tried to do Python development on Windows, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, it just does not work. It, it just does, it doesn't work. Um, and especially most of these machine learning libraries are kind of designed by people that are running them on Linux. And maybe if you're lucky, there's like a Windows port that kind of works. But if you ask questions about it, they're like, well, we don't really maintain that. You should really just be using the Linux version. So um, extremely important to understand Linux um, if you want to do this kind of stuff. Uh, that's where all the libraries are pulled from. Yes? Um, so I'm not super familiar with how like the underlying algorithms of, of Siri. If, if I was, then Apple would probably have some, some lawsuits in my way. Um, uh, but I would imagine typically the way most of these things work is when you're dealing with spoken word, most of the applications first convert it to text, and then they do something like this. There are approaches that are able to handle like the raw audio directly. Uh, but the majority of what I've seen tends to first convert the audio into text and then do stuff like this on it. Um, yeah. What's that doc that you have for your VM? What's the doc? Um, this is actually just the GNOME uh, is doc. GNOME. GNOME, uh, GNOME 3. Uh, and then you can install, I don't know, what's, what's, we have config, I think, and it allows you to like, move stuff around in your desktop. Stuff like that. Um, yeah. So, you know, you have to have a cool Linux desktop if you're going to be doing machine learning. It's a requirement. I have one more question. Yes. Is anything that you've shown here applicable to be parallelized in a cluster environment? Um, <laughs> yes, can be. Um, if you're trying to process, like, let's say you have a data dump of a ton of unlabeled. Um, reviews, right, and you want to label them all. The kind of naive way to do that is you have this giant list of reviews, and you label the first one, and you take the next one, and you label the next one, right, and it takes forever. Um, but you can actually label all of those at the same time um, in parallel, right, so that would be a really good example of doing kind of like an embarrassingly parallel implementation. The idea is you have multiple copies of the model living on multiple machines in a cluster, uh, and then you send portions of the data to each uh, instance of the model to label it much faster. Um, so batch processing is one of the applications that you typically see this stuff on, on the, the data processing side being parallelized. Now on the training side, um, neural networks in particular, there's a lot of stuff that can be done there using um, GPU acceleration um, to sort of train the network in, in certain uh, computations on each layer to be done in parallel. And so there's ways that you can speed up the, the training process there as well. And even some ways you can distribute and do distributed training, uh, but that's that's a more advanced topic. Yes? The emergence of BERT affected your day-to-day -day work? The emergence of BERT. Um, <laughs> uh, like I said, the past year in NLP has been um, crazy. Um, some of the stuff that's happened, uh, it's kind of been like almost a watershed moment uh, for NLP this past year with, with BERT or I mean Elmo. Um, I haven't started using BERT um, yet for any of the projects that I'm working on, mostly just because in order to run it, you need like a really, really beefy uh, machine. Uh, it's not an inexpensive model to even run. 
Uh, but I was actually reading a, a paper recently, and it was calling, uh, I think it was called like Dilbert or Distilbert. And the idea is that you take this really, really, really expensive model, right? And you train it to do some task, right? But this model is so expensive and big, it wouldn't be practical to actually use. So then you take a smaller model that's more dumb and easier to run, but then you have it learn from the more expensive model. And then the, the dumber, smaller model is the one that you actually use. And they were getting like, it was like almost 95% um, this, like compared to the performance of, of full work. So it's like very, very close. So for only select applications, that extra like 5% would really matter. So I am interested in eventually pursuing something like that. Spacey also allows you to use more um, BERT style training as well. If you want to incorporate something like that into your pipelines. So. Okay. Are there more questions? Yeah. Well, well, thank you all. Uh, I hope this was. Uh, if you were the president of Love, why don't you use Arch? Uh, why don't I use Arch? Uh, because uh, it would have been really annoying to set up inside a VM on Windows. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, so, so Ubuntu is kind of kind of. You, you know, not everybody uses Arch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't people that use Arch let you know that they use yeah. Arch? Yeah, I've never been an Arch power user. I've always been with Ubuntu all the way. That, I like the convenience. Is that for the void What? Is that the void link? So, um, <clears throat> So how old are you? <laughs> Wait, um, rumor has it. Uh, rumor has it that it was, yesterday. Yesterday was your birthday. Yeah, yesterday was your birthday. So. <laughs> you're looking nice. I mean, <laughs> you want to just, who wants to sing happy birthday? Huh? Before I end it. Oh, oh, <laughs> or do you want to sing? Yes. I mean, rumor. like, in my head, some people like requested. Nine, I know you're not. <laughs> sing happy birthday on video. Uh, but uh. I don't know. Where's, where's, 